So I want to start off by saying um, that God longs for a relationship with each and every one of us. Um, yes, we know that. We know that he longs for a relationship with us. But to actually understand what that means, the word long means to feel a strong desire or craving for something, especially for something that is not likely to be attained. And I've always known, you know, God, oh, I'm going to start crying already. <laughs> um, God longs for relationship with me, but whenever I hear it in that way, it just, he longs for a relationship that's not likely to be attained. This is a message that is for God's people, so say Christians, um, people like me who think that you're actually holy, that you're actually saved, you're actually living for Christ. But church, some of us are deceiving ourselves. Let me get back now because I'm jumping ahead. Um, so God longs for relationship with you. The God of all creation, he has everything he could ever need. And he doesn't need any one of us. Yet he longs to have your whole heart. He cares about your hobbies and interests. He cares about your desires and your future. And he cares about your decisions and your eternity. Last Wednesday, if you missed that service, I highly recommend going listen back to what Pastor Chad preached on, um, returning to your first love. I told him right after service, I was like, okay, I have to preach next Wednesday because every single week somebody's coming closer and closer to being and to saying the message that um, I, God has given me. Um, but while I was, like, in service, I was, like, clenching, and I was, like, oh, Lord, please don't let them say what I want to say. And then God just put on my heart, like, you have a completely different message. And I was thankful for that. Um, but, yeah, so this message is specifically for the church. Um, people who are living their lives, going to church, serving at church, trying to live a holy life. Um is it wrong of me to say that whatever your relationship with God looks like, it probably doesn't align with what God wants your relationship with him to look like? Does that make sense? That, I might have said that wrong. but um, God wants to be closer to us. He longs for a relationship with you. He longs for something that is probably not ever going to be what he wants it. Um, in the Bible, in Matthew 7... Um, 21 through 27, it says, um, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one that does the will of my father who is in heaven. Church, this verse is for the church. It's not about the people who are out in the world sinning, not caring about God. He is saying, these are the, my people. You are my people, but yet you will hear me say, depart from me, for I have never known you. Church, does God know you? Does he know you? Thank you. <laughs> Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Church, imagine that. You're on, you're in judgment day, and God's saying, depart from me, for I never knew you. When your whole life, you've been deceiving yourself, thinking, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I got baptized. I go to church every Sunday. I do all this stuff. Yet God's going to say, depart from me. For I never knew you. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. 
Most Christians are living their lives minimizing the extensiveness and the importance of what God wants. And therefore, many Christians sadly are going to get told on to judgment day, depart from me for I never knew you. And I don't know if that scares y'all, but whew, that terrifies me to even put myself in a situation imaginarily thinking about that. Um, but I believe that God wants to remind his people that he is to be feared above all else. So the title of my message tonight is Let's Be Real. And she can put up the slide. Thank you. Um, about a month ago, I was praying what I was supposed to preach. And the words be real was just put into my spirit. And so I'm just going to do just that. Um, I'm going to be real with y'all tonight. Many Christians get too swept up with following the things of this world to even think about God. And I'm just being real with y'all. I forget about God on a daily basis. Whether that looks like me being stuck in five o'clock traffic, overwhelmed by the rush hours at work, and even sometimes while I'm singing on this stage for worship. It's not hard to forget about God and let the attacking thoughts of the enemy slip into your mind when you have not prepped, no, when you have prepped for your trial with junk. Each day our bodies wake up and become hungry and so does our soul. And that hunger needs to and will be filled by something. Something. Is it going to be God? Is it going to be Netflix? Is it going to be gossiping conversations at work? Is it going to be grumbling or complaining? What are you filling your soul with? When we fill our souls with distractions of the world rather than prioritizing what's best for us, we're filling up on junk. And whenever we do finally make time for God, we're numbing ourselves to the true protein and the true fulfillment that God has for us. When we fill our souls with distractions, we're ultimately preparing for failure when the time of tribulation and testing of our faith comes. And it will come. And it is simply impossible to keep your mind on God all day long, but it's essential that we implement him into our daily lives and are suited up with the armor of God because the very moment you take your mind off of God, the very moment you let your guard down, you are subject and at risk of an attack. And how you spend your time preparing for your trial will determine your faithfulness to God, your love for him, and will expose your maturity in Christ. You are going to reap whatever you are sowing, whatever you are filling yourself with throughout the weeks. You are going to reap that in the time of testing. And unlike us, as much as we might try sometimes, the enemy is constantly remaining alert. In verse 1 Peter 5 through 8, it says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The devil wants to destroy us, church. He does. We all know that the devil wants to destroy us. But do you know? Are you intently aware? Are you alert that he is trying to destroy us at every corner that we turn around? And that is why anything that is keeping you away from your Bible is your enemy. Anything that keeps you from meeting with God in that quiet place is your enemy. I, I was watching The Chosen uh, just the other day with CJ, um, and I was kind of preparing. My message was already done, but I saw Jesus. Um, he was preparing for his own message. He went out to that quiet place and he was practicing it. And he was like, um, well, this doesn't sound right. Let me try to reword it this way. And I was just like in awe about that. Um, but anything that's keeping you from that quiet place with God is your enemy. Anything that is just another excuse to comfort you in your lack of self-discipline is your enemy. And anything that justifies your disobedience is your enemy. If the devil can steal your time, he's got you where he wants you. Because you can be a so-called Christian. You could go to church. You could, you know, say a little prayer. But if your mind isn't focused on God throughout the day, does he know you? 
you have to, you have to ask yourself that does god know me and do i know him truly because god, guys he wants more he always wants more he wants more he wants us to grow and i say this with um coming from a place of my own i felt convicted from reading all this and this last w- week i think it was sunday the sunday service the words just hit differently whenever I sang them. And I told that to someone here. The words, I was just singing them differently. They, they meant something different because I had an intention when I was praising and whenever I was worshiping God. We can't just go through life with no intentions, doing whatever, going with the flow. We have to have intentions in our time because the devil sure has intentions with his attacks. We have to be prepared, church. There's no more excuses because when judgment day comes, God will not hear them. And there has been countless amounts of time when I've forgotten about God. And it doesn't matter if I've missed my alarm or had the worst day or things just keep coming. It doesn't matter what my days are looking like. If you're not making space for God, when you forget about him, all that means is you have other priorities above him. When you forget about God, you aren't loving him and you aren't fearing him. And the sad truth is that many members of the church minimize the power, authority, and ability of God. In Isaiah 66 verses 1 through 5, um, it says, This is what the Lord says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things, and so they came into being, declares the Lord. These are the ones I will look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit, and who tremble at my word. But but whoever sacrifices a bull is like one who kills a person, and whoever offers a lamb is like one who breaks a dog's neck. Whoever makes a grain offering is one is like one who presents pig's blood, and whoever burns a memorial incense is like one who worships an idol. They have chosen their own ways, and they delight in their abominations. Church, let's be real. How many of us have delighted in what is an abomination to God before? How much how many of us are still doing that? I wasn't going to say, but I'm going to say, um, there was this this very stupid, I don't recommend it to anyone. It was a stupid little TV show that just came out on Netflix and it was called Exo Kitty. And, um, I didn't look into it before watching, but one of the descriptions of it was LGBTQ, like TV shows for LGBTQ people. Well, I started watching it and I'm like, I don't want to watch this. This is bad. After every episode, I was saying, this is not good. This is bad. Yet I keep watching it. And then by episode eight, the main character is questioning her own sexuality. And I was just like, God, like, why am I watching this? I know it's not of you. I know it's not good. This displeases you. Why am I watching it? Why am I tolerating it? Church, how often do we tolerate sin? We might know that it's wrong. How often are you tolerating participating in gossip? How long are you tolerating looking at something on your phone that you shouldn't be looking at? How long will you be doing these things that are displeasing in the eyes of God? Now I lost my place. Hang on. I'm sorry. Um, they delight in their abominations. So I will. I also will choose harsh treatment for them and will bring on them what they dread. For when I called, no one answered. And when I spoke, no one listened. They did evil in my sight and chose what displeased me. Church, this is for the church. This is not just for sinners. The sinners, they might know, oh, yeah, God doesn't like this, whatever. They don't really care. But we know what displeases God. And when we tolerate that sin, we are saying, God, I don't care about you. God, I don't care that you don't like this. I don't care because I want to do what I want to do. Um, okay. <laughs> 
They did evil in my sight and chose what displeased me. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your own people who hate you and exclude you because of my name have said, oh man, your own people. God's own people who hate you and exclude you because of my name have said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy and yet they will be put to shame. The Bible says even the demons tremble with the name of Jesus, but do you? Do you tremble at the thought of going a day without meeting with God? If not, you need you need that conviction. You need that holy conviction. That's what I needed. Do you tr- Hi. <laughs> um Hi. Do you tremble at the thought of uh, not being with God, not meeting with him, not hearing from him? Or have you lost sight to the righteous fear and respect you once had for God? Church, God has told us how to live, and he has shown us which ways are pleasing to him. And we know what ways displease God. When you forget about God all day long and spare two minutes of your time to say a prayer before bed because you forgot about him. You know what's displeasing to God. The church loves to rave about the love and mercy and kindness of God, but that is only one side to our God. And when we forget about that, that's when we deceive ourselves. We should always be talking about the love of God, so don't get me wrong about that. But um, when we forget why his love's so powerful, that's when we deceive ourselves. Because God's love would be meaningless without his wrath. God's goodness would be nothing without judgment upon the wicked. The goodness of God, the depth and love that God has would be nothing without his burning hatred for sin. I mean, we always, and pastor always says, you know, when you talk to somebody about the love of God, it brings them to them. But what about the people that are already brought to God? What about the people who already know God a little bit? We need to have this holy, righteous fear of God so that we will respect him and turn from evil, to turn from what displeases him. Church, we need to go back and remember the way it felt when we first realized how desperate we were for the forgiveness of our sins and how breathtaking it was to be forgiven, knowing that we deserve nothing but his wrath. His wrath was never meant for us to endure, but it's what some of us have chosen knowingly and unknowingly. Do not deceive yourselves. We need to come back to fearing God. There are some people in the church who are deceived, believing that they are saved because they once said a prayer and accepted Jesus since their heart or was baptized. The way you can have confidence in knowing that you are saved is yes, by believing and trusting that Christ died for our sins. But you will see the fruits of repentance. The evidence of salvation is the evidence of repentance. The evidence of a faith is a changed and changing life. How do you know that you've truly repented all those years ago? Because you continue repenting today. Through the work of sanctification, he has not only changed your life, but he continues changing your life. The truth is that some people in the church are deceiving themselves. You think just because you go to church or you sing on the worship team, volunteer, cast out demons in the name of Jesus, or even that you are a pastor means that you are saved. Let me tell you something. I'm going to remind you of something. It's that Lucifer led worship right before God's throne. He beheld God's glory. He was anointed. He did not fear God. And guess what? He did not endure in the kingdom of God forever. The Bible says that he fell like lightning. One third of the angels surrounded God's throne and they beheld God's glory, but they didn't fear him and they didn't endure in the kingdom forever. 
Adam and Eve, they walked in the presence of God's glory, but they didn't fear God. They didn't endure in the garden forever. There are many people and pastors who have started ministry excited, wanting to help people that are in love with God, but they didn't fear God, or maybe they used to. But somewhere along the way, they lost sight to what was important. Oh, church, don't lose sight to what's important. What God requires and wants in his kingdom is people who will fear him and will hate sin as much as God hates sin, who will not tolerate it. And it's a process. You grow through it. But it's the truth. You can't be comfortable living and tolerating in sin and things that are displeasing to God. Uh, Hang on. I'm sorry. (laughs) They will not and are not enduring the ministry forever. The people who have started some ministries who have lost sight to what's important. And that's why we're seeing these big time churches and worship singers who were being exposed for falling down. And that's why we see their status and community crumbling because God is a righteous God who knows and searches their hearts and will not allow their darkness to stay hidden from his people. God will not allow people who do not fear him to be glorified and anointed forever. There will be a falling. Church, We have not brought a healthy balance of the holy fear of God into the church. The fear of God keeps us from falling into the trap of lawlessness. And if you want to see the anointing of God increase in your life, then we need to hate sin the way God hates sin and not just love righteousness the way God loves righteousness. The fear of, oh, sorry. Uh, The next verses that I'm going to say is Psalms 19, 9 through 14. Um, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. Oh, church, to fear the Lord, you're going to endure forever, but it's a choice. The decrees of the Lord are firm and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By your servant is wo- Oh, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is a great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Church, we have to start praying for God to convict us about the hidden sins, the hidden disappointments from him, the hidden disobedience in our hearts. We have to start asking God to convict us from that and show us his truth. Forgive my hidden faults. And keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent, and great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Church, when we truly love God, we will keep his commandments. And what do we need to do to keep his commandments? We need to hate that of which he hates, and flee from it because it displeases him. Tremble at the thought of how angry it makes him. Tremble at the thought of how sin makes God feel. (laughs) Remember what it felt like when we were first saved and when we were first in so much awe of God because we knew we deserved nothing but his wrath. It's time to stop making excuses and justifying our own behavior. It's time that we need to wake up because God is calling us to go deeper and deeper and he's always wanting more of you. Are you listening to his calling? He wants us to come back to our first love. But first we have to come back to the first fear we once had. The first decision that made us believe, oh, I need saving because I am a sinner and I don't want to spend an eternity in hell. It's time that we disrupt our lives and make room for him. And it's time that we put an end to our excuses and come back to the fear of God we once had or else we will not endure forever. And we will hear the words, depart from me. I never knew you. 
Church, to fear God is to be in awe of him and to have a righteous respect for who he is, what he wants, what he loves, and what he hates. Church, God longs for a relationship with you. He longs for something that is not likely ever going to be attained. Only by fearing the Lord, we will endure with him in his kingdom forever. And only by fearing the Lord, will we come back to our first love and fear him and endure forever. That's pretty much all I have to say. But I do have some more scriptures that I'm just going to read um, to leave off with this message. Um, in Proverbs 9, 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. In Exodus 20:20 20, 20, says, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you and keep you from sinning. Luke 150 through 52 says, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm and has scattered those who are proud in their innermost growth, inmost growth, and he has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. In Psalms 25, verses 12 through 14, who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the way they should choose, and they will spend their days in prosperity, and their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. And Isaiah 33, 6 says, He will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. It's a treasure. Proverbs 14, 26 through 27 says, Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress. For their children, it will be a refuge. Ooh. The fear of the Lord. To fear the Lord, it says that for your children, that will be a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. So those were all verses about the fear of the Lord. And then I have just a couple more about the wrath of God, because I feel like that's necessary um, to include. So in Ezekiel 7, 7 through 9 says, Doom has come upon you, upon you who dwell in the land. The time has come and the day is near. There is panic, not joy on the mountains. I am about to pour my wrath on you and spend my anger against you. I will judge you according to your conduct and repay you for all your detestable practices. I will not look on you with pity. I will not spare you. I will repay you for your conduct and the, for the detestable practices among you. And then you will know that it is I, the Lord, who strikes you. In Romans uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 13, this is a long one, so just bear with me, but I'm almost done. Um, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kingdom, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God... In, in quotations, will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, I might have just reread something on accident. I'm going to read it again. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who is, all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law that are righteous in God's sight, but those who obey the law and who will be declared righteous. 
and I'm over. I'm almost done. Psalm 76 verse 7 says, It is you alone who are to be feared. Who can stand before you when you are angry? And then the last verse that I have is Isaiah 13, 9 through 13. It says, See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wickedness for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. I will make people scarcer than pure gold, more rare than the gold of Ophir. Or Ophir, I don't know. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. So church, I just want to ask that each of us just go home tonight and pray a prayer of God, convict me. God, show me if there is any hidden wickedness inside me so that I can worship you and know for sure that I am saved, that I am a child of God and that I will endure in your kingdom forever. Thank you guys for listening. That's kind of it.